Peace, everybody. Welcome, welcome to this incredible evening of celebration as we congratulate Brian Janae on their latest collection, Because You Were Mine, which just dropped this week. We are super excited to welcome Brian, also known off the page as Breezy, along with friends and comrades, Cynthia Manick, Kristen Hill, J.R. Mahung, and Amber Flame. I am so incredibly excited for y'all to be exposed to these intentional and complex poems and so i'm going to give you a little bit about the book you can go ahead and get because you are mine directly from haymarket books the link is down in the chat please share go ahead and share the broadcast tell all your friends as they're plating their dinners and getting settled down from the day's work they need to come and listen to some poems so let's get into it Real quick, my name is Erica Foreman. I am a publicist at Haymarket Books. And again, it's my extreme pleasure and honor to host tonight's event and hear all these incredible poems. Uh, I'm gonna open up with a brief quote uh, from the book, which begins, quote, I've decided I can't trust anyone who uses darkness as a metaphor for what they fear. Poet Brian Janae writes in this stunning new collection in which the speaker navigates past and present traumas and interrogates familial and artistic lineages, queer relationships, positions of power, and community. Because You Were Mine is an intimate look at love, loneliness, and what it costs to survive abuse at the hands of those meant to be protectors. In raw, confessional, image-heavy poems, Janae explores the aftershocks of the dangerous entanglement of love and possession in parent-child relationships. Through this difficult but necessary examination, the collection speaks on behalf of children who were left or harmed as a result of the failures of their parents, their states, and their gods. Survivors, queer folks, and readers of poetry will find recognition and solace in these hard wrought poems, poems that honor survivorship, queer love, parent wounds, trauma, and the complexities of familial blood. Again, you can get Because You Were Mine from the link in the chat directly through Haymarket Books. And I'm going to kick this off with letting you know who our incredible poets are that are going to be joining us this evening. Uh, the order will go Amber Flame, Kristen Hill, J.R. Mahong, Cynthia Manick, and then of course we will have a wonderful feature from our um, our star poet this evening, Brian Janae. So I'm going to kick it off with Amber Flame, who is an interdisciplinary artist whose work garnered residencies with Hedgebrook, Vermont Studio Center, and more. Her first poetry collection, Ordinary Cruelty, which is fabulous, was published through Right Bloody Press. A Flame is a recipient of Seattle Office of Arts and Culture City Artist Grant and served as Hugo House's 2017 through 2019 Writer in Residence for Poetry. Flame's work featured in Alone Together, Love, Grief, and Comfort in the Time of COVID-19. She is a program director for Hedgebrook, a residency for women-identified writers. Amber Flame is a queer black dandy, yes, come on dandy, in Tacoma, Washington, who falls hard for a jumpsuit and some fresh kicks. Let's go. Let's get to these poems. Welcome to the stage, Amber Flame. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, the way your intonation made that bio so much more fly. And luckily, not as long as I was. I was like, uh oh, <laughs> settle in, folks. I hope you clipped it. So thank you so much, Erica. Thank you, Breezy, for inviting me to celebrate you. I feel like half ownership of this book because I feel like we've been writing about our mamas together for a real long time now. Um, and I was trying to think of what I wanted to say besides get the book, get the book, get the book is, um, it's a rare thing that you find yourself in writing company with somebody who has so many aligned, parallel, intersecting moments with you. Um, um, it's sort of like, you know, when you find that rare black therapist, <laughs> it's like exactly. And you're like, really? Okay, really though? You know, it's 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 a very special thing to get to write beside you. Um, you make me so much smarter, Breezy. You're so fucking genius. And I am honored to know you. I'm honored to be called your friend and your comrade and your accomplice in this world. Um, so woo woo, I brought you some mom poems. What's up? You've heard them in the early stages and here they are finished. Um, I'm reading from New Shit uh, in honor of Breezy. We grieve different people when we say mother. 
Road trips always began in the back seat in the late afternoon, the lull of the road carving a straight line between Arizona and Texas. I'd wake from my heat nap hours in, sticky and sweat slicked between my sisters as my mother rolled down her window to the copper gust of cooling desert. Headlights cutting a monotonous white tunnel in the gathering dark, my head tilted back against the seat. I watched the stars multiply exponentially as night fell. By the time she called for me to climb up front, there were no more constellations I knew by name. Her eyes were bleary and red, and she had played all the tapes with music to sing along to. There was always how I learn of the men who hurt her the worst. The ghosts haunting my mother litter the highway like Texas spring roadkill, gruesome. I never learned how to look away, each entrail in violent detail flashing quicker than mile markers in our bubble of light and secrets, my mother and I hurtling through the night. We'll get to joy, but first, <laughs> uh, this one's called Thirsty Bitch. It's a vanguard poem, which is a form I made up to link things that maybe um, don't necessarily link besides that I say so. You should try it. It starts with a short little overview poem and then three poems that are linked by time, by subject, by theme, by an image um, to follow. Thirsty Bitch, Vanguard. I know I have always been thirsty, even as my body, infant, rejected mother breast. I know I have always been a squalling stomach, tornado mouth, insistent tongue, suckling lips, seeking, seeking. One, my mother thinks I wrote Prince's Darling Nikki. There is no such thing as cold water in Arizona, just water that once was ice or, if you're lucky, Kool-Aid made by the right person, not too stingy with the sugar or too generous either. Mostly, I drink from the hose, brassy and barely cooler than my mouth, thumb pressing against the flow to aerate, to mist a rainbow into the dry air against baking sun. At Kiwanis Park, my mother's perfect small Tupperware pitcher of red sugared powder and water is quickly emptied, the church picnic never accounting enough for the raw devouring throats of kids in the wild. I join the line of children waiting for their chance to slurp a trickle, to suck limp flow from the park's concrete fountain, patient filling of cheeks for a true swig, an art to accomplish a full swallow without lips touching metal. My mother says not to put my mouth where others have been. I stay gulping, unsatiated, until my name becomes a chorus of complaints. By the time the Lord, number two, by the time the Lord cures my allergy to milk, I am too old to breastfeed. There is no sugar to coat the water at Bible boot camp, but it turns out sweat makes it just as sweet. I have already passed out three times from heat exhaustion when the Christians drop me on my head during the trust fall. I worry the whole ambulance da ride down the dirt road out of the forest of Flagstaff, Arizona, how much it will cost my mother to pay for this out of pocket. I don't ask for water. They find several small pebbles lodged under the skin of my scalp, and someone decides I'm fine if a little dehydrated. Back at camp, I'm allowed to drink two extra cups of the saccharine toothache Kool-Aid they save for the drill instructors. I don't know who called, but they tell me my mother wants me to finish out the week. Three, we stop for snacks in El Paso, Texas at 1.30 a.m. There is no TV in the house, and so there is no way of knowing, just the pipes gurgling and groaning, just the spurt of dirty red-brown water smelling sick while it splashes slop over my hand and the rim of the cup. I remember how my mother smacked it away from my lips like poison, and I went to bed thirsty. It's midweek before her check hit, all the stores full of emptied shelves, so my mother filled the gas tank instead, a road trip on a school night, searching Oasis, a drive so long the outside grew green. I remember how cold and clear and sweet the water seemed to my supplicant tongue, this body a sprawling desert. Okay, let's move on towards joy a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. When I tell you I used to roller skate, do not picture the occasional special treat to Skateland, wheel grease and thin carpet, shoe spray and old hot dogs. Do not think dim rotating lights and couple skate, reverse skate, the hokey pokey, although I mean those times too. When I say I used to roller skate, picture my mother in the living room, on the couch, facing the big window, watching as I whipped around the corner, piston thighs propelling me over broken cement straight toward her. Imagine her growing horror as I approached too fast to do anything but meet my eyes through the glass 
clasped between us, fingers clenched in anxious fists as I flew, leaping last second up the step to swerve and slam my small body to a stop against the front door. When I say I used to roller skate, I mean I wore them like shoes, fearless knees bloody when I got up, and I always get up, suck the gravel from scraped palms, and roll the fuck on. And I'll end with the last time I cracked my mother up. I was drunk. Slick with quick quips and dramatic interpretive dance to Katy Perry's firework till she held her hand up, palm out, winded and wheezing. When she caught her breath, she said, this is why I don't drink anymore. I'd piss myself and watched me out the corner of her eye. I didn't fathom then the inevitable curl and ache, how we clench harder to hold our pee. I imagine I understand now, wonder what she would have told me about pain, about how hard it is staying alive if she'd survived it. Sometimes I imagine us old together, the bare 24 years between us no more than a blink of now and last week, sharing the surprise of a decline, a body waking up to a new way to break and still somehow go. I imagine plotting easy. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Y'all, give it up one more time for Amber Flame. Those poems were incredible. The range, the valency, the heart. Ugh, just love, love, love. Always hearing your work. Thank you so much for blessing the space and salting the ground so that we can welcome the rest of these beautiful poems. Next up, we have Kristen Hill, who I'm a fan of the poems and have not yet heard Kristen read them aloud. So this is also selfishly a little treat for myself. Uh, so I'm deeply looking forward to it. A little bit about Kristen Hill, who is the author of How Her Spirit Got Out from Aforementioned Productions, which was published in 2016. It also received the 2017 Jean Pedrick Chatbook Prize. Her work has been featured in the Academy of American Poets Poem A Day series, Poetry Magazine, Pank, Up the Staircase Quarterly, Winter Tangerine Review, shout out to y'all, and elsewhere. She is the recipient of the 2016 St. Botolf Club Foundation Emerging Artist Award and the 2020 Mass Cultural Council Poetry Fellowship, as well as this year's Vermont Studio center residency please show all the love 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 for Kristen hill i am so happy to be here and thank you for that really beautiful introduction um amber your poems are beautiful i mean you know um that just is a given but i just really thank you and some the ground is important um, especially when we're reading difficult pieces. Uh, and Breezy, oh my gosh, thank you for always welcoming me genuinely into your orbit and just always just bringing this genuine sense of like truth and just risking the truth um, when you read. Um, I just, there's so much love for you. Um, and I just can't say that. And look, my voice is trembling. Um, I just can't say that enough. And I'm just happy. I'm just overjoyed uh, to celebrate this book. Like genuinely, my love for you. Like just, I hope it, it comes through <laughs> this, this limited space. <laughs> um, so um, I'm in a tender place, y'all. Uh, this is also... Um, I'm thinking about Amber. Thank you for sharing those poems. Um, my mother passed away a year ago, um, and I'm, I'm coming up on, I'm, I'm at that anniversary, and um, I'm just going to read uh, a poem for her. Forgive what remains when a dress is empty. Forgive it in a red dress. Forgive its fullness, feeling the breath of doorway, always watching, warning you to. Forgive the separate and that's a bit of tongue free when speaking. Forgive the bowl of belly that couldn't fill with child till it found you in a foster home in Texas. Forgive that your first craving was for arms, the way you ran to find them. Forgive the smell of left shoulder, 
Forgive skin the color of slightly brown pink drip gravy, the complexion that gave you away to strangers. Forgive hands that wielded hot comb, fingers that rubbed on Vaseline when heat clipped your ears, fingers that threw cigarette butts into cold coffee, fingers that gave you alphabet, put pencil back in your hands, told you to try your name again. Forgive it when it is made of sweat and callous feet, over time, and another white lady telling it what it did wrong, forgive it, at a desk making paychecks stretch for milk and bread and heat this month. Forgive it singing Luther Vandross too loud in department stores. Forgive it when it shrinks next to men. Forgive it on its knees. Forgive it when it's a busted base on a living room floor. Forgive that it's connected to mandible, to clavicle, to ribs, connected to all things that break if hit hard enough. Forgive that it is often mistaken for something to be kept waiting. Forgive that you are always walking into the room of it, that you feel it was dreaming with words. That was, I don't know. Um, I can't read a lot of poems about my mom right now. Um, it just hurts. Uh, but just the celebration of her is also important, um, and it is so com it's complicated. Um, and so I want to honor that complexity um, and honor the poems that are going to come through too from Breezy. That just complicated love um, is a real thing. Um, this next one it started with a news story, and then I took a bit of found language from um, a news article. Uh, and then it morphed into something really personal, but I mean, the person was political. Um, and uh, I was really shocked by how the poem turned. Are we still good? This week, Trump's bloated name drawn onto the side of an endangered manatee. According to officials, the, enemy, the animal does not appear to be seriously injured. Someone adds in the comments that obviously it was a joke. Calm down, liberals. Highlights the part of the article where a president's name was scraped onto the algae growing onto its skin. From what they could see, nothing was truly threatened. The sea cow was probably too dumb and fat to feel anything. I think of all the ways cruel begins as a joke until it chooses to finish what it started. The friend I'd known for years didn't stop when I asked and asked again. I thought maybe he didn't hear me. Later, he told our mutual friends that things just got out of hand. I thought she knew I was just playing. I remember when I was sure he heard me. I recognized it was my fear that made him smile so loud. Still, I attempt to explain the surprise and he said I didn't die there, I tell myself. Even here, I wrote that as the first line of this poem and buried it. Anyways, he had work in the morning, offered to drive me home. I didn't have to walk back to my dorm in the snow. I laughed at everything he said on the way and tried not to let him see my handshake when I took the gum he offered me. He asked, are we still good? I chewed my tongue, relieved I could do something with my mouth until he parked unlock the door to let me out. I thanked him. I was so sad. I didn't run. I'm gonna read this last poem. Thank y'all. Just, I think the book and the readers that you're gonna hear tonight and have heard in just the space of honesty and truth telling. And um, I just, I don't know. Um, this last poem, you'll see like little bits of found language. Um, um, and uh, it's about the relationship I'm having with my neighbor. Um, and I just, before I, I, I just wanna thank y'all again for having me. And also just, I'm just so happy to celebrate this book. A white neighbor says I owe her. A white neighbor says I owe her a civil conversation. Not even my landlord, y'all. A neighbor who lives in the triple decker. 
She says she can smell me every time I open my door. I'm hard to approach. She prefers to discuss things with my partner who is reasonable, polite, white. She's never had a problem with anyone. My trauma asks what's wrong with me. Raised differently, she guesses aloud. Faulknerian, my impression fills a room in her, a spot on her floor. We, she says, are oil and water. I wonder which one she intends me to be. I alert her allergies. She clutches her chest and coughs. My essential oils leak into the wood in her hallway. I wear dabs of lavender on my wrist to smell myself calm on two buses, two trains, back and forth every day. She called the police on neighbors for parking. What could she do to me? Have you ever seen a black woman ask to be left alone? Sometimes it's not an ask. It's a dare, sometimes it fights for air. Not my first time, not the worst. How many ways in a day coming home, trying to get my foot in the door, put my shit down so I can breathe. I was 15 when a cop ordered me onto the curb in front of my house in Kansas City. The neighbors closed their blinds like I'd never lived next door. Even when I to if I told her this, she probably asked, What's, what does this have to do with me? They are related. The cop asking me to empty my pockets. The white woman asking me for another thing before I can get my key in the door. Greedy cousins that live close enough to drain me. My mama laughed at the absurdity of white folks when they hurt her too much. That's what happens next in the hallway outside of her door. When she says she wants to keep the peace, it's a joke that cuts me open so I laugh. Throw my purse at her feet. Tampons and lipstick scatter in the hallway she keeps saying is hers. My untidy spills into her apartment. My serrated voice invites her to see the reflection of her, of me, in her teeth. I know I abandon safety when I unknot the part of, that is taught to obey. They'll find reasons to shoot us either way. Much I appreciate y'all. Who black women, black folk, black queer folk, black folk from the future and beyond just want to be left alone. Say that again one more time. Thank you so much, Kristen, for those poems. Um, thank you for sharing that radical honesty and radical tenderness, which I think you're absolutely correct, permeates so much of everyone's work. And so I just feel so honored and blessed to bear witness. Thank you so, so much for those poems. Our next poet that we are welcoming is J.R. Mahung, uh, who is a Belizean American poet from the south side of Chicago, big up one time, and one half of the poetry duo Black Plantains with Malcolm Friend. They teach, write, and study in Amherst, Massachusetts. JR is a 2016 Pushcart Prize nominee, a 2017 Emerging Poets Incubator Fellow, and the 2018 Individual World Poetry Slam representative for the Boston Poetry Slam. Their poetry is published or forthcoming in MoCo Literary Magazine, Maps for Teeth, What's Good, Cosmonauts Avenue, Winter Tangerine, again, shout out to y'all, Freeze Ray Literary Journal, Drunk in a Midnight Choir. I love the title of that magazine so much. Cantab Anthology, Vinyl Poetry Journal, and elsewhere. Their second collection of poems, Since When He Have Wings, is available on Pizza Pie Press. P.I. Like the math, not the pie, although that's cute. Make sure y'all type that in right. JR's mixtape is not for sale, but they'll ask you to buy it anyways. Tweet them about rice and beans at JR Mahung on Twitter. Welcome to the virtual stage and these beautiful poems, JR Mahung. Hi, um, my name is JR, which you can see because it's Skype, but I'm awkward. So, uh, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you, Breezy, for having me here and um, for allowing me to read alongside so many of these, like, really lovely folks and poets. Um, yeah, the other day, uh, Breezy and I were talking and realized, like, we've never read together. We've been homies for, like, the past six, seven years. and never did a reading together. And I'm, like, really grateful that this gets to be our very first. Um, yeah, and also just grateful to be a person in your life because to um, 
I don't know. I'm like, yeah, every day I'm a little bit happier because I get to live in a world where you also live. Um, and that makes me, um, yeah, uh, that makes me happy. So I'm going to read some poems because uh, that's how a reading works. Um, here we go. Oh, and you might hear some noises in the background that sound like a cat. That's my cat um, named Frank Ocean. Um, it's around here somewhere. Um, okay. In which my 37 crushes and I all hang out. <clears throat> and all 37 of my crushes are one person now, a composite of desire, mine and entirely their own. I purr the way a cat will sound for what she treasures. My too many loves. I know not what I seek in you, but I can tell you all I have imagined. There's a space in the world, this one or another, where I cut rind from citrus and you say you want mint without sugar, which I leave on the counter to steep. And I join you on a couch which could be ours or yours or mine or someone else's, but no matter because you have robots on the tv screen and i joke that my pussy is a god box and maybe you laugh or don't or maybe maybe i'm not joking and you know fiction is an impossible space until rendered once i asked a high school crush out to mini golf and we never went once I caught the scent of a boy so sweet I could have kissed him right there in front of anybody. Once I wondered, could you love me? And listened close for an echo, a prayer, anything. Um, yeah. Uh, Breezy, you and I feel like we started a gender transition around the same time, uh, and like had a very, like a few different, um, yeah, a few different like things within that align pretty closely, which was uh, a kind of cool thing. Um, uh, shout out to having a twin, um, and uh, I feel like a lot of these poems are poems that uh, a lot of these, all three of these poems are poems that I think um, through that, yeah, through that time. Um, I like thoughts, ideas, and sets of feelings that opened up because of, um, yeah, because of the conversations and the way that you held and opened up space. So grateful to you um, for allowing these poems to live. And also, if at any point you're like, that's a weird poem, I'm sorry. I, you know, maybe you're a better friend than I'm a poet, I don't know, uh, my bad. Um, shout out to having cool ass friends though. <laughs> You being the cool friend, I don't, I'm weird. Um, okay. I'm screaming from the edge of the world with so much more to give. My fingers braid gently into yours and your kiss lands precious underneath stubble on my cheek, wet from a tongue which was drawn over lips which moments before named me as your girl. A girl belonging in this place in this world, you don't love my cooking, but you like that I love to cook for you. I'm learning how. Broccolini pasta, no cheese. Spaghetti and slow stewed pomodoro. Potatoes roasted salty and crisp. And yes, yes, I am a glad, uh, and yes, yes, I am glad to be alive and alive here with you. Where I take out my phone in quick remembrance to say, look, a cat. Did you know a slow blink can mean I love you? And dysphoria is a word that can shred a body apart. Blink and I love you. Again, I am a ghost. Blink, I love you. Again, I'm drifting away. Blink and I love you. Again, I'm falling apart. Blink. I love you. Again. Word. 
um, last poem. Um, uh, this poem is called Ash Estradile and Thursday. Um, yeah, and it starts with a quote from Judith Butler. The phantasmatic nature of desire reveals the body not as its ground or cause, but as its occasion and its object. Estradile and Thursday. I wake to my body, newly bloomed. The memory of a before echoes phantasmatic. Picture me and two students. Their eyes roll as nature dictates when I say the day is, is wonderful. Of what or whom do we owe this pleasure? Desire, a revenant that makes itself plain and reveals a tie to all haunts prior. Remember the memory of living in a body before the body was yours. And now, two small breasts, a chest not unlike the day before's and yet changed as much as the eye can know, I feel my growth and contour its soft and slight turn sore from the cold. I ground myself with breath as Tana taught me and wander or wonder the many worlds that would have been caused to never live myself towards this one. I see a girl, but different, bearded and baritone and beautiful and blessed as every other I have known through glass and it and grief and its way of soaking every frame. But today is occasion for want and how I want and 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 I want, and I want a body that is this body, its own frame and image in a room with no one to object. Thank you all so much. And uh, yeah, special thanks to you, Breezy. Love you, homie. OK, bye. Ooh, the want is wanting, that emphatic desire. Oh, thank you so, so, so much for those incredible poems, JR. Uh, can we take a minute? Can we just take a minute to absorb all this radical tenderness, this radical joy and acceptance, even through the hardness of so much that we are surviving through and attempting to thrive through. Just thank y'all all so, so much. Mm, I got goosebumps. And it's like 70 something degrees. It's not cold, so, okay. Next poet on deck, speaking of radical honesty and radical tenderness, is Cynthia Manick. Uh, who is the author of No Sweet Without Brine, editor of The Future Black, Afrofuturism, Black Comics, and Superhero Poetry, winner of the LaSalle Prize in Collected Poetry, and author of Blue Hallelujahs. Love, love, love me some Blue Hallelujahs. She has received fellowships from Cave Canem, Shout Out CC, Hedgebrook, McDowell Colony, and Chateau de la Napoule. I do not speak French, among other foundations. Manic is the creator of the reading series, Soul Sister Review. If you haven't checked it out, please do. It's dope. And our poem, Things I Carry Into the World, was made into a film by Motion Poems, an organization dedicated to video poetry. Manic has also debuted on title for National Poetry Month, a storyteller and performer at literary festivals, libraries, universities, and museums. Manic and her work has been featured in the Academy of American Poets Poem A Day series, Brooklyn Rail, the Los Angeles Review of Books, The Rumpus, and other outlets. She currently serves on the board of the International Women's Writing Guild and the editorial board of Alice James Books. Shout out to our comrades, Alice James. She lives in Brooklyn, but travels widely for poetry. Welcome to the digital stage, poet all around, leader, steward, <laughs> all the things, Cynthia Manic. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, first off, Breezy, this book, I was reading it on the bus this morning and literally did not want to get off to go to work. That's how you know, I was in, that's how you know. This book is brilliant and congratulations on seeing what's dark um, and going through it, going through the darkness and coming out a better version of yourself for it, for writing it. So congratulations for putting those things on, on the page, for making it real to yourself and for others. 
Okay, so I'm going to read um, just three poems. So this first poem I actually wrote um, in McDowell. I was actually, I was, in, I was in my studio and I was like, I need to write something. And I realized that I woke up from a dream and it wasn't a bad dream. So how do you, how do you, how do you realize that you're okay? How do you realize that moment? This poem is called 3 a.m. and the moon is curled like a sea. And I didn't dream of coffins today or the scattering of names or trees I can never recall. Instead, there was a silver dog chasing joy in the shape of a hat. A long dead cousin eating Jack and Jill cookies and my hands held fistfuls of not yet ripe tomatoes that needed a dark place or a bag to become true. Do I need to go shopping or check on a relative? The dream book says tomatoes symbolize harmony, but my mind wonders how long it takes for a star to burn out. And this last beats are like a bear for the heart and love for the first time. I once read that black poets write love poems the least, as if we're too busy swallowing miles worth of dusk Howling wounds, knowing how often our atoms shiver and our bodies part, but can we not do both? Banish the lines, go brawless and numb, fumble in the dark with a sweat so sweet he or she is well fed. Fill pages with bathwater and breaths ungraceful. Movement like a train of yellow flowers because it's what we saw on our very first date. In another dream, I see a fleet of newly painted dove white subway trains, ugly beautiful, as if a ghost through pure light. People both alive and past are full of bright colors I can't name. They move so smooth, my ear barely recognizes the revolving jubilee, the sky inside all of their hands. So um, my next poem, if you do not know that um, the Calm app lets you go to sleep listening to bedtime stories by celebrities. It's amazing, okay? This poem is called My Calm App Lets Me Sleep with Idris Elba. One, this is my best waste of time, hearing a voice tell a tale about a jungle when I'm at the end of the world. I remember my right to breathe, that the body knows how to unfurl, imagine its tongue could carve a castle out of a mountain. Dear manufactured calm, we get used to being lumped over. I got a face that's never at rest, but Idris's voice makes me want things. A brother to grow old with lines of smiles, a necklace of dry watermelon seeds, or a welcome heated hand that calls a thigh goose bump birthing. Two, some days it's easy to remember that even the devil needs someone to love. To find soft moons in the edges, crooning words like a downward river, so we forget his hard hands at work. When I watched a TV show bewitched, I thought, Darren must have had great dick. The James O. Jones of dick, the kind of dick where you're almost naked but wearing one sock in a head wrap. To make a woman hide herself, hide her door like she's a knotted ball of hair, of sorries, and a nose full of questions. How can a man be unhappy when his woman is magic? I want to ask my mother this or my dead grandma in the dream because I've heard her story second and third hand. Three, it just is not talking about owls and ancient rock art like it's something sacred we ripen together. I believe him and I almost forget my day of basement apartment laundry, hauling my back black roots closed in a keychain of blue pepper spray. I make this man, I mean devil, I mean nice man, ask for my hand and body every time I see him. One day I think he'll say no to my no thank you to want to break something. Who wants to sing to something that's broken, pry it without a key. Challenge echoes know how to rescue themselves, so I keep my spray loose. Swallow my spit, think of calm and Idris, crooked path to my cotton nightdress. 
Uh, I'm going to do one more poem. And thanks again for having me. This is a poem about um, self-care. Self-care when you have multiple selves to multiple people. Notes towards a poem on self-care. Start with decisions. Take a break from mirrors. Decide to stay in bed today and tomorrow. Count time only through midnight. Isn't there some voodoo about being the middle child of a middle child? You should Google that. Start humming to broken bones of electrical appliances. That OCD player, yep, you can fix it. Take on do-it-yourself projects, face cream, shelves, the perfect guacamole, and a Home Alone arsenal just in case a Joe Pesci-like villain tries to arrive. Pretend the varnish brush is a staghorn. Who needs an app for calm? Be greedy about breathing. Be greedy about breathing. Avoid phone conversations. Wait only through yes and no, text or emails. Hey baby, can you be my melanin maid, Marion? Yes. Does Blank have a job? Oh no, girl. Is your brother, father, husband accounted for? Silence. Yes, a voice is required. Realize that he, she, they can't be your son. Trust what you can hold in the hand. When we talk, the body vibrates. Aim for a dinosaur roar when people least expect it. Enjoying words like Kilimanjaro and origami. Write old for the Jew rag. Sign us to the soul train line where you dance in military choreographed precision, so fresh and so clean, outcast. Take a look, it's in a book. Reading Rainbow, Jolly Ranches, your mother's kitchen table. At any altitude, remember that ink, ink can hold the right kind of memory. Thanks guys. Oh, thank you so much for those poems. You had me dying on that second poem and I'm not going to repeat because they didn't hurt and if you didn't hear you need to go on back and, and re-listen to them reads okay <laughs> thank you so much for those incredible tender and joyous and hilarious poems Cynthia I appreciate you to the moon and back all right we here while we here for the following Brian Janae is a poet and teaching artist living in Brooklyn they are the author of Blessed Are the Peacemakers, which was released in 2021 and won the 2020 Cave Conum Northwestern University Press Poetry Prize and After Jubilee, published in 2017. Janae is the recipient of the St. Boletoff Emerging Artist Award, a, Hedge, a Hedgebrook alum, a proud Cave Conum Fellow, Big Up CC, and a 2023 National Endowment of the Arts Creative Writing Fellow. Their poetry has been published in Best American Poetry 2022, Plowshares, The American Poetry Review, The Academy of American Poets, Poem A Day, The Sun Magazine, Jubilat, and Waxwing, among others. Janae is the co-host of the podcast, The Slave is Gone. Off the page, they go by Breezy. I'm so excited for y'all to hear these beautiful, beautiful poems. And again, hit the link in the chat. You haven't gotten your copy. It just came out. You're not too late. Get one, get two for your friend, three for your mama, four for all the people in your community. Thank you so much, Brian, for letting us celebrate you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. This has been so wonderful. I, like, couldn't have had a better reading. Uh, I don't feel like I don't even need to read poems. Y'all have just, like, been serving up so much joy and so much, like, truth and realness. Um, but I am going to read poems because I'm supposed to. Um, so I start, I'll start with this poem that I always start with reading this collection. Um, and it's called Against Confessional. You are not my God. I owe you no debt, no gratitude. Will get gift, no object, cut and bleed, no sacrifice in your name. I offer only my voice that it catch in your throat, drag you in the rooms you dare not enter yet fill and fill. I offer you your stink your rot, your festering wound. I bring no salve, no balm, nor rag to bite and silence the scream charging up from your diaphragm. I offer you your scream, your voice, your tremble and terror. I carry only a mirror held at the right angle. 
that you may see and see all. Um, I feel like I had to throw off several gods to write these poems. And so I like starting with that poem and just declaring, you know, that you're not my god. Um, but I do have a god, uh, I, you know, I think my dog is like a, a minor god in my life. Um, and I'll, I'll read this poem that's titled Poem Where My Dog is the Hero. Um, yeah. Sleeping, my dog likes to nestle between my legs, high up by the thighs, my one leg arching over like a bridge she runs to for shelter, butt to butt, nose to calf. I sleep, butt to butt, nose to calf, we slumber, and she keeps my pussy from danger. Sometimes I tell jokes about her clinginess, pretending to be annoyed with how she claims the center of my bed. In my dreams, though, she's always there, lips curled up, exposing her teeth, setting a boundary like she does when another dog won't let her, won't heed her subtler cues or acting how she gets when the wrong men get too close, too interested after dark. When my ex kneels to force her hand inside me, Lily releases a low grumbling growl, try it and I'll take your fingers. And I drift quietly back to sleep, peaceful and not raped. A lot of this poem, these poems, are bearing witness to the survivor in me, um, and and hopefully the survivors, the many many survivors, living among all of us. Um, in my second book, I wrote about discovering that my grandfather is a child molester, only to discover. Um, or only to remember shortly after that, that he had molested me as well. And my brain had sort of just blocked out that, that memory. And I went back to one of the poems that I had written there about him and sort of did this erasure that allowed me to reclaim my story and tell what happened to me. And a lot of this book is about reclaiming my story and telling what happened to me. And so I'll read this erasure of the poem Atonement that appears in my second book that's called in this poem, Amen. You do not understand memory, the origin of fear, the passing whisper, monster slick with sweat all those years, learning the tiptoed walk. You know he must have, but you cannot hear it. Too present, the faint scent of terror, will, his will, you feel his body, choke on his hard love. You say, my sins, nothing but blood. Still, you fear salvation, tremble beneath the feet of saints, allowed to forget the bruised fracture, to hide memory in the lines of their hands. The next poem's called When Spite is the Only Thing That Feeds You. Bite down and break the skin against your teeth. Chew. Take full possession of your mouth. Let it hang open or purse the lips tight as a zipper so not a morsel slips loose. Stay present. And if the past comes knocking, your grandfather's hands popping up all over your body, bite down again, harder. Use all of your teeth the canines, the incisors. Grind the flesh down between your molars until it's a mushy lump at your throat. Swallow, swallow again. Keep what you can down and what you can't spit into the air. Be a child again. Wipe the grease from your lips like blood and rub the residue into your jeans. Laugh, let it be hysterical. Um, I appreciated that folks read you know, that, that Kristen, you read some of your hard poems um, that have laid the ground for that. Um, and Flame, you read some of your mama poems. A lot of this book is hard mama poems or complicated mama poems. Because um, love, love of our mothers is, is often complicated, though we off, are often discouraged from talking about that. Um, and so I'm going to read some of my, my, mother, my mother poems. Say it wasn't my fault you suffered. 
after Toy Derricotte. Head anchored between your hip bones, nudging the cervix from the inside. Days the long and weary task of opening and me all too big from the start. Mother, in another era, I would have killed us both. Must I alone be blamed? I know the crease of the scar creeping up your belly. How after my brothers were pulled limb by limb from that same crater, you cradled the wound so gingerly I worried you might split apart. Mother, you don't have to forgive me. I know what it's like to refuse and still be opened. Nothing more isolating than a body. Acutely, the lines come down around us. We each trapped in our own peculiar cells, unknowable one to the other. We spend all our lives learning to read the pinch and crinkle of the skin, the limbs gesture, heads every particular angle. We might as well be as divining stars, even without gods we bed manna and milk, to be told where to go, what to do, and how to bear the yoke of our bewilderment. Please, mother, we say, tell me what you mean. Um, this next love poem is one of my favorite that I wrote for my mom, just because it it centers around what I'm supposed to do with her hair as she ages, because that's always the question. What are you gonna do with my hair? You're just gonna lock it up. You're just gonna cut it off. Um, and so I finally wrote a poem about me and my mother and her hair and um, and the expectations. Love poem. After I cut mine, my mother asks what I will do when she is too old to raise her arms above her head to dust the crop that grows like wild grasses leaping from her skull. This isn't the first time she's this is the first time she's asked how I will care for her when it's time, though it is always about her hair, how I'll probably cut it off or lock it up. How after all this time and all her skill, I never acquired any of my own. Then I like to say I will take care take her to the hair salon as if I don't know she is asking how much and how well I love her. Sometimes I say she better start teaching the grandkids how to warm a hot plate and part the hair evenly at the root. Some days though, I can already see my gloved hands slippery with dye and all that stubborn gray at the base. I'll pull the wide tooth comb slowly through her hair, through the length of her hair. It will almost be enough. Dear mother, I'm angry. Dear mother, I hold my anger like a grappling hook. Dear mother, my anger wears me like a glove. Dear mother, wait for me. Dear mother, I worry my anger will outlast me. Dear mother, I am gripping my anger by the throat like a strangled hen. Dear mother, I have strangled my anger. Dear mother, do you know what it takes to strangle? Dear mother, I have buried my anger on the side of the road like an accident victim. Dear mother, nothing rises with the dead like anger. Dear mother, sometimes the anger flows through me like the breath of life. Dear mother, no matter what I do, all I breathe is fire. Dear mother, it burns. Dear mother, I have found the fire extinguisher and hit my anger over the head with it. Dear mother, I fear sometimes the anger is madness. Dear mother, my anger is still here nestled beside me like a stray dog. So somewhere in the course of writing all these poems, um, I felt like I was doing a reshuffling of my priorities and a reshuffling of um, yeah, of, of 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 my gods, essentially. And this next poem is called In Search of a New God. And it starts with the scripture, which is stricken through. Um, Honor thy father and mother, and your days will be long on this earth. And then offers a revision. Get free, and when you do, take all who are willing to walk. Um, and the praxis. Try not to leave your mother. Even when her eyes move like scalpels, looking for the parts of you she'd shave away, cut off like a wart she's grown tired of looking at. Instead, watch the way she bites her tongue and try not to fill in what she might say if she wasn't trying to respect your boundaries. Remember you are teaching new vocabulary, new ways of moving, of shaking off that old rugged cross. Remember you both spring from the same root and how love has tangled your freedom all up in with hers. And remember Harriet hunched over in the painting at your auntie's house, her rifle pointing towards the sky, her hand reaching firmly back to protect the one she buried, 
Say get behind me, mother, and don't forget the rifle points both ways. And no matter how the dogs pressed and the knives reached with terror, turning back was never an option. Um, and finally, this poem, I'll end with this poem against mastery, which I've been told is a kind of secular prayer. Um, and yeah, it, I don't know, it felt like the right title for it. Um, so against mastery. Give me no seat at the table. Let no trembling hands lay food on my plate. Let me lord over no one and nothing. Not the dog curled up in my bed, not the land nor children who wander through my care. Let me learn from the babies and be always laughing at my ignorance. Only humble discovery give me and keep my eyes on the pattern of birds' wings breaking the blue overhead. Let me face the ones I harm with open palms and let love be the method and measure of my worth. Keep my heart with my people and the coal glowing beneath my feet. Let me run and run and run and let the flame of my torch never go out. I am here with you to burn the house down. Keep me to this. Cut me down before you let me lose my way. Thank you. Y'all, please show some love to this incredible, incredible collection of poems because you were mine. Show some love to Breezy for reading those incredible poems. I want to take a minute just to acknowledge the complication of what liberation looks like. People think that it's very cute inside of your little communities that you're not even really in community with. It starts at home. It is not easy, but it is persistent. And that is something that we all have to embrace and define for ourselves. And so I just I'm so grateful for your work always. I'm so grateful to be in community with these incredible poets. Um, give it up for all of our poets, Cynthia Manick, Kristen Hill, Amber Flame, J.R. Mahong. I have been your host, Erica Foreman. Please get the book. Please share the word with all of your networks. I thank you so, so much for joining us this evening. And y'all have an incredible, lovely, and beautiful evening. Thank you. <laughs>